This is yet another one of those episodes that just kind of neatly fits into the Our Man Bashir situation. And if you've... <laughs> I'm saying that vaguely on purpose is all I'm going to say about that. But you don't understand what I mean by that. I mean, the very idea that Bashir can manage to even partially fix a plague that has been genetically engineered by the Dominion, a.k.a. the Founders, who are literally the masters and experts of genetic engineering, well, you can kind of see the logic in why they would be so capable of doing this. Now, what's weird is this extremely dark, horrible episode starts on something humorous. In fact, Worf only gets one scene in the entire pic, and it's actually rather amusing. You, Just the, his face when he turns the mug. I do got to admit, the, the 90s-style animation for that is actually kind of uh, amusing. But what I find funnier is that why the hell is Quark using this approach to ad design? This is basically shotgun style. You know, put ads everywhere, make sure people get it. But anyone already on the station already knows about Quarks, so that's not going to help. So the only people that the, that ads would really apply to is new people, transitors. Okay, that makes sense. So you hit points where there's going to be traffic. You know, the docking ports, in other words. Or the regular you know, trade hubs or whatever, or even just in the promenade. It's not that hard to imagine him being able to get the permits to do that, but instead he, without permission, decides to just sort of hack everything in order to make his new ad show up. It's just weird, weird approach for Quark. Anyways. So then, oh my god, we're in the Gamma Quadrant again, and we, we get our mention of Dominion Space, which is over there. Now, I only bring this up... Several people commented on previous episodes where I made fun of how often they were just kind of casually going into the Gamma Quadrant, of how nobody seemed to care about the possibility and problems of in interfering with Dominion territory. And there were certain implications that could be inferred, based on the way certain episodes go, that Dominion territory basically extended to the wormhole. If absolutely nothing else, we know with high certainty that the Dominion are monitoring the wormhole and the surrounding space around it. I mean, duh, of course they are. They were monitoring it as soon as people came through, I'm sure. And I guarantee you they were monitoring it as soon as it started to become an issue with regular trips coming through. So, <clears throat> they actually have their first on-screen acknowledgement. Oh my gosh. Of, uh, I've got a white hair right here. And it's the first on-screen acknowledgement of, hey, look! It's Dominion Territory, but we're over here. We're not in Dominion Territory. Don't worry. Now, this episode takes course over the course of several weeks, about three weeks, roughly. Now, <laughs> what I find most interesting about that is I feel really, really bad for Kira, who goes off into a nebula for a week. This is going to sound strange, but considering it was a solid week, why not just go back at that point? Why not just head back to Deep Space Nine, do her job, live her life, and then come back for them a week later? Now, I, I suppose you could say the obvious thing, well, they couldn't send an emergency signal to her at that point, but at the end of the episode, towards the end of the episode, when Bashir decides to stay behind, they mention that he could just send a message when they're ready to pick him up, which implies that he could send a message to that relay, which bounces it through the wormhole back to DS9, which means that's not a valid complaint. So what the hell? Why did Kira have to wait in that poor nebula? Imagine spending a week in a van, basically. On a trip you didn't plan for, no less. Uh, granted, she's not exactly the holodeck type, but I sure had the, hope they had a Game Boy in there or something. Anyways. I don't actually have much to say about the construction of the episode itself. A lot of people spoke positively about the nature of it, you know. I'm going to save everyone. Yeah, I failed. You know, hubris. It, it's Everyone just constantly talks about the hubris and arrogance. The, the director talks, that would be Rene Bergenois talks about it. Um, you know, uh, Alexander Siddig talks about it. Terry Farrell talks about it. And I totally get that. It's definitely the predominant theme. But at the same time, I, I, I guess I don't feel it, you know? <laughs> I know that sounds horrible, but what I see, based on presentation, based on acting, by the actors who felt this way, no less, is that they saw a horrible situation which they believed they had the possibility of helping. And they wanted to help. <laughs> the end, you know? Now, Bashir later admits, I was looking forward to being, oh yeah, by the way, you know, that cure, I totally cured it. Of course he was, because he does have that arrogance, that, well, let's call it what it is, pride. But I would very strongly argue that the pride was his secondary motivation after, I want to help these people. 
And, of course, that applies doubly for Dax, who wasn't quite as arrogant in the whole process. I also want to say, though, one thing I find amusing is there's this bit where they argue, well, you know, on this other planet, we, we cured them within a few hours. It was, it was a co total, well, it was actually a couple days, and then a few hours to fix the water table, and then we were good. Okay. That's a nice argument, and I see where you're going from it. But the problem is it ignores two facts. First of all, the implication is given that that other situation was people who simply didn't have the equipment to look into this sort of thing. Now, yes, Starfleet medical equipment is top-notch, but there are two other powers, arguably three, but two really definitive powers that have better medical technology than the Federation, the Borg and the Dominion, and this is an engineered virus by the Dominion. Second point to be levied at this point is that this, that was a naturally occurring thing and this is an artificially generated thing, specifically coded and designed to mark these people forever as those who, who just dared to rise up against the Dominion. Actually, if I can be really pragmatic and horrible for a second, I think there's a more, for lack of a better way to put it, pragmatic motive behind the Dominion doing this to them. Because what they have done is not just send, this is a sign to everyone, but they have just ensured that this spacefaring race, formerly, <laughs> formerly spacefaring race, will never be a threat to them again. They have ensured that these people will die young, and that they will have a chance of not even having children thus basically culling their civilization and population without ever having to really fire a shot. Now, they also sent the Jem'Hadar, because you don't do things half-assed when you're in the Dominion, but point remains, right? They have effectively ensured these people will never rise up again, unless someone comes by and cures them, of course. <clears throat> Maybe I'm the only one who's thinking in the political sense, by the way, but I would think that after the possibility of a cure is entered, Maybe some kind of long-term mission, like it would have been nice if Cisco acknowledged at the end we're looking into the re recolonization efforts. Just a line slid under there. Because, think about it, the Dominion regularly patrol this area. We see this, that's why Kira has to go hide in a nebula and play solitaire for a week. God, that would be horrible. Anyways, so we know that the Jem'Hadar still patrol this area. Now, the Jem'Hadar aren't going to notice immediately, of course, but at some point or another, they're going to notice this has been cured, probably in about a generation, give or take. Which leads me to my core question. What are they going to do for those poor people who are on the other side of the wormhole? Because they are screwed once they find out they've been cured. You think the Dominion's just going to let them be? Anyways. <clears throat> so... <laughs> There's a nice... I'm not even going to comment on how nice it is that the food and the water and the air and the virus don't affect Bashir or Dax, who are different species, I remind you. But let's just move on from that. The only thing I really have of strength to talk about in this episode is the culture of these people. Because they have a culture centered around the fact that we die young. Now, I don't mean like the Salarians over in Mass Effect, because they're a species of people who live short lives. That's a difference. This is a... This is, this is closer to the Krogan, really, more than anything. Because we have a species of people who have just become acclimated for two centuries, remember, he mentions that, have just become acclimated across multiple generations to the idea that you will die and you will die young. You might die as a child. You might die as a young adult. You might actually have the ability to have children of your own. And then you'll die. I mean, the poor woman in this very episode made it. Barely. That hit me, by the way. I'll go ahead and be honest about that, because you can just tell, and the actress does a wonderful job of this, you can tell that she was just holding on to get that child out and to have that child be born. She dies within seconds of his birth. Now, I mean, granted, childbirth is a, a very damaging, horrible thing to the body, so that makes medical sense regardless of all, of all else, but I like to think that the only thing that was keeping her together at the end there was sheer willpower and nothing else. And as soon as she saw the baby... That was it. It's entirely possible she never even properly recognized the fact that he was cured. Just, he got born. Thunk! Anywho, so we have an entire culture generated around this concept, and we see it in a lot of the interactions. There's a lot of decent world-building in the background. Now, what's funny about this is this is a planet of hats. And yet, for one of the only times in, in Star Trek, this is a valid thing. Because this blight is so universal that it affects everyone almost equally. There are very few exceptions in an environment where everyone is affected by the same thing in basically the same way. So it makes sense that they're a planet of hats, for once. So we see, you know, what are you, you going to demand of me for it? 
What's it going to cost me in order to make this happen? You know, this kind of uh, barter system, give and take thing is very common on this planet. It makes sense because by and large, you can see that based on how quickly people die and how little people, I'm trying to say this correctly. When you have a system where people don't necessarily have the ability to educate themselves in order to take up a craft, I mean, not, it, it, we, we think of things in low-tech low and low-skilled jobs, but the truth is those, those kind of concepts still have to be taught. You know, farming, growing, rearing, uh, crafting, cooking, these things are still things that have to be taught and learned. In, a, in an environment where only a few people get to the point where they can do that and may or may not have the opportunity to pass on that knowledge to someone else, anything crafted... Anything of value is suddenly of significantly higher value than it otherwise would be. Now, yes, they probably teach their children at a much earlier age by necessity, but my point remains because, again, not everyone dies at the same time. So it's entirely possible that someone may learn how to weave cloth and then die without having children or someone to pass on that knowledge to, and that knowledge is gone. I mean, we kind of know how this works because that's how real life worked until a lot of different types of technology came along to help us pass on knowledge if we didn't have someone to word of mouth it to, right? Same concept. It's just these people do obviously have technology of writing and, and, and whatnot, but they just die too quickly to really make it significant. That brings me to my next point, motive. You could argue, oh, well, clearly these people could just write everything down and advance their technology if they were all just to collate their knowledge and information. There's two problems with that. The first, of course, is the obvious, that at a certain set point, it will take too long to learn the knowledge that's been gathered in, like, this central archive for, pe for it to be feasible, because people will then die before they finish learning it. But problem two is motive. Why bother? Now, you could argue very strongly that there's a civilization motive to do that, and I would agree. But how about an individual perspective? What's the point of me trying with that? Again, try to imagine living with the knowledge that you could die any day. That literally tomorrow you could die. That you could quicken. And it, there's no avoiding it. The, the scars go red. They, go, they become inflamed, actually, to be more accurate. And thus, oh, well, yep, I'm dead. <laughs> she mentions that they have this worship of death, but I think it's more accurate to say that they have come to see death as the only relief in their existence. The idea of being able to finally pass on and finally die, rather than having to endure has got to be something that is, in a weird way, comforting. I know that sounds so strange to say it that way. I imagine at least some of you understand what I mean. And so we see that... I, I like to picture that the doctor gentleman, whose name I don't remember, please forgive me, is, is not an uncommon concept. Someone who has lived old enough to care, basically, and to desperately want to try and find a way to ease people's suffering. I have no doubt in my mind that that poison that he, has, that he gives to people to allow them a quick, painless, well, relatively painless death compared to how slow and horrible they die from the blight, I like to think that um, anybody under those circumstances, that, 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 that poison was given to him by someone else or taught to him by someone else or mentioned to him by someone else, passed down in other words, and he happened to be one of the lucky ones to, to carry forward the knowledge of this technology. There's also a line that really bothered me. It's a bit where he mentions, you know, today I slept on a, a bed for the first time in my life. And I actually had a warm bath and food. And, well, the, obviously the idea here is that the hospital has access to what is effectively luxurious resources. The ability to do things that you can't do normally because, you know, the resources, the manpower, the infrastructure just doesn't exist. And so, the only question I have is, where do they get that from? Now, of course, I love to speculate, so I like to think that these people literally donate to this hospital to make sure that it has these comforts. Not necessarily out of the goodness of their hearts, although there's probably some of that as well. After all, again, the doctor himself is someone who is obviously cares about these people. But in addition, there's, it's kind of like a form of insurance, if you think about it. You pay into the pot, and if something happens, the pot's there to cover you, Right? I mean, that is the core concept of insurance, the way insurance should be, to put it bluntly. And so I like the idea that they pay in to this pot to keep this hospital running and with these, let's call it what it is, luxury items for these people. Again, I've never slept in a bed before. That really stuck with me. So they pay into these, get, make sure these luxury items exist so that people can go in there, enjoy one good day, and then die. And, of course, you kind of have that idea of the cycle 
people aren't actually consuming that many resources by being there because they're not there for long. They enjoy their day and their night, you know, a good night's rest, a good meal, a good bath, and then they die. Basically a total of two days overall time being consumed by them, and that's not a lot of resources, relatively speaking. So you can see how this kind of system would perpetuate. Now, of course, I could just see the people who are violent or the people who are desperate trying to break in and force themselves to enjoy these comforts, which could cause all sorts of other storytelling concepts that I'm not even going to get into, but anyways... <clears throat> One other thing I thought about. There's this interesting scene between uh, Bashir and her where he talks about, you know, I, I wanted to fight back death. I wanted to, to get another day from death. And she says, well, but everyone dies. And he says, well, and he just segues. But the, the, the beginning of that conversation has a lot of potential. We here in real life tend to acknowledge that death is an unfortunately acceptable reality for the society, eh, wrong word, for the existence we live in. In other words, if nobody died, things would get very bad very quickly. Now, I argue very strongly that the reason for that is because our entire society for literally millennia has been engineered and designed around the idea of people dying eventually. That that is, for lack of a better way to put it, natural. Uh, the, thing, the catch, of course, is if we had an entire society where people didn't die, our society would be fundamentally different, right? I mean, that's just logical. I point that out, though, because that brings up the interesting definition of what is a natural death, or perhaps more accurately, when is a natural death? When is it acceptable for someone to pass on? When do you stop trying to use the science and the technology to prolong life? And that is an extremely hotly debated topic and one that I don't want to get into as far as controversial territory. But what I do want to mention is it's interesting that they give this brief insight into the idea that for these people, well, that definition is very written stone. The moment those flare red, that's the time they're going to die. The only difference is how long and how slow and how torturous it's going to be. Remember, that poor woman lived for over two weeks well beyond when she probably should have died, just enduring the pain and the agony because, well, she wanted to make sure her child was born. So you can see how it's kind of more of a case-by-case -case thing, e even on a macroscopic level, than it is, you know, well, you, you hit 75, so this is now Logan's run. Just some interesting thoughts here. Overall, even though I don't have much to talk about, I did enjoy this episode. It was... A very good usage of subverting expectations. I know that's become something of a bad word in modern lingo when it comes to discussing fiction, but I do think it does a good job of classic subversion. The idea of, I mean, picture this, right? How many of you saw this episode and was like, okay, so he's going to cure the plague? I mean, duh, right? That's, that's Star Trek in general, or excuse me, Star Trek in specific and, and fiction in general. The doctor shows up, cures the plague, we win. That's going to be the dilemma. It's going to be a medical drama. Instead, this ended up being a character drama. The medical side of things almost didn't matter. We barely learned anything about how exactly he finds this cure or how it actually functions or why it is that only the children have it. Instead, it's all focused on the character because that's the actual point here, the development of Julian Bashir. Very enjoyable episode, very dark episode, but properly dark because it doesn't end on a and then everyone's doomed forever. It ends more on a and now we have a method to make things better. And I prefer that. Very Star Trek. I hope you've enjoyed my thoughts. I'll see you next time.